and you guys can see my little screen over here. Okay. Um, I want to welcome everyone to our um, third night of the Autism Awareness uh, webinar series, uh, Beyond Words. We are so, so excited to have Catalina Rana here tonight and uh, speaking about Gestalt, a world of words and feelings. And I am just honored to be here with Catalina. I've only known her for less than a year, but um, she is fascinating and kind and creative and um, has been my teacher. Uh, we work together for the PRC Sotillo. She is officially an ambassador with PRC Sotillo, an AAC ambassador, and she uh, frequently presents uh, and joins in with our LAMP trainings. And I'm excited for her to be here tonight because I hope that um, you'll find her story and her perspective enlightening. Um, and with that, I'm going to drop it over to um, John. Take over. Well, I have to give you just a little background of how I met Katlena. Now, that... So Catalina and I met, how long ago did we meet Catalina? Do you remember about how long ago it was? Less than a year. Less than a year ago. And we met at a restaurant. What did you think about that meeting at a restaurant? It was awesome. Yeah, well, I was very excited to meet you too. So I had no idea. We just we had, so anyway we met, and when we met, you brought me these gifts, which was so kind of you to bring me these gifts. And the first thing you gave me was this picture. I'm trying to make the slideshow show so it shows a little larger. But this is your own graphic work, and uh, and you gave me this picture of me with a kid. That, where did you? How did you? Did you see this online, or how did you come up with this picture idea? YouTube. I know it. There is a YouTube video of me working with a kid, and on YouTube with a little, a little guy. And so I saw. I knew that's probably where you got it. And you wrote on there with your own hand, "Human connection," and it just really touched me. So I, I, this is going to be in a very honored spot in our home. And uh, when I was looking for this today to get it on the PowerPoint, my wife said, "You, you look awfully young there," and I had to remind her. I had to remind Cindy that when we started, uh, I was a pretty young man doing speech therapy. So I was going to maybe show a video of Tyler, but I'll, that's another day. And then I had to find a video of my picture of my wife and uh, uh, doing therapy almost 30, more than 30 years ago. So it, those are some videos. Wow. Maybe someday I'll sh show people some therapy sessions of 30 years ago. But anyway, then you did something else. You gave me this picture of LAMP methodology in each in a visual representation of the lamp methodology and it is just genius work um so anyway i wanted to thank you for that again it's going to go in the new manual when it comes out and uh how long how long i guess i'm gonna i don't want to steal any of your thunder uh, mm -hmm. but um anyway we'll, we'll go over that next uh, just a uh, couple i just want to ask maybe one or two questions if you don't mind do you like doing these presentations Yes, it is super fun, and I like feeling like I am making a difference. Well, you are making a big difference, and we're very grateful for that. I, I, that project I gave you to store the next thousand words, how long did it take you to do that? <laughs> Probably too long. Yeah. And then can I tell them about the letter you wrote for you let wrote to me about the different the different apps you've tried and you, you've tried all of them. So tell them what your passion is. I'm trying try not to steal your your shirt. Is that in your speech? Yes. OK, I'll leave that alone. Let, let's go. To, let's let's let me quit. So I don't steal any of your thunder. All right. So you're going to give a speech first and then take questions. Is that correct? OK, I'll, I'll be quiet now. I'm going to get I'll make you the host. Can you 
see my cream. Yes, we can see your your first slide, a beautiful picture of you as a child. My name is Kathleen of Verona. I work part-time as an AAC ambassador for PRC Saw Tello, the company that makes my communication device. One of my favorite parts of being an ambassador is joining classes about AAC and getting the chance to answer questions from an audience of professionals and parents of AAC users. People want to know what it is like to be an AAC user. I am not a speech language pathologist, so the informational content in this presentation comes from the research of more qualified people. However, I believe I have a unique perspective to offer as someone who relies on AAC to communicate. I have been a device user for about a decade. I also have 25 years of experience being on the autism spectrum. And of course, not many professionals possess my keen ability to impersonate a GPS system. Before we get started, I would like to define AAC. AAC stands for Augmentative and Alternative Communication. Simply put, AAC is any way of communicating that is not speech. AAC is used in the context of disability, but I think it is helpful to give examples more relatable to everyday life. You might use facial expressions to show how you are feeling, nod to signify agreement, or use gestures to the person who cut you off in traffic. But for people with severe speech or language disabilities, AAC becomes a primary mode of communication. Gestures, facial expressions, and signs are called unaided AAC, meaning that no tool outside of a person's body is used as a communication aid. Aided AAC, on the other hand, does require a tool outside of a person's body to use. Communication boards, books, and devices are considered aided AAC. Tools in this category can be labeled as high, mid, or low tech, which describes the level of technological sophistication a system has. AAC is a developing field, changing radically as technology advances. More and more people who need alternative communication have access to it now, as the technological, social, and financial barriers that seemed so high just 10 or 20 years ago are diminishing with time. As the field is developing, it is vital that the voices of those with complex communication needs are heard, listen to, and are a part of the conversation. I got access to a communication device later in life. I can definitely appreciate the impact assistive technology can have on one quality of life. In this presentation, I will share about my journey to becoming a proficient AAC user. I will cover some basics about autism and alternative communication, my experiences with both, as well as discussing some things that make my device functional for me as a user. Lastly, we will touch on the topic of social interaction and AAC etiquette. Part one of call growing up autistic. My mom tells me I spoke later than most children and when I did begin speaking, much of what I said was borrowed from my sister or from things I heard on TV. I remember finding it difficult to come up with my own words and order the words in my head. So oftentimes it was easier for me to just repeat what I heard. Words were not tangible. Words were floaty little pieces of sound that popped into existence and disappeared before I could make any sense of them. Words were not like pictures in a book, which I could study for as long as I liked, or like music, where I could rewind and listen to it again and again. By the time I was three years old, I had memorized much of my favorite musical, Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat, and though I could recite the code of many colors, song with precision and clarity, I had immense difficulty communicating my needs, thoughts, and feelings to others. Activities that caused me great discomfort, others did without a conscious thought. Making eye contact was one example that faces such a complex image, and staring at someone's eyes felt like staring into the sun. I could not hear what someone was saying and look at them at the same time. Emotions hit me hard and fast and no emotion could be clearly defined by the bounds of a smile or frown, laughter or tears. Emotions were confusing for me. 
I had my share of odd behaviors. I used to take the air of my stuffed bunny and rub it between my lips. I liked how it felt. The fabric on the edges of the ear eventually wore off completely. For hours, I organized cloth dolls and patterned blocks. The activity was a comfort to me. I always knew exactly what to do and exactly what to expect. My parents did not know it then, but I had autism spectrum disorder. Autism spectrum disorder, or ASD, is a developmental disorder that causes repetitive behaviors and communication deficits. Autism is called a spectrum disorder because while everyone born with ASD shares some core characteristics, those characteristics manifest in a variety of ways and degrees of severity. Autistic people have different social understanding and have difficulty with communication. Common examples of this include difficulty participating conversationally, understanding social etiquette, non-literal language, reading facial expressions, body language, and making eye contact. Some autistic people merely appear awkward, while others are seriously disabled. Many fall somewhere in between these extremes. The second defining aspect of ASD is restrictive and repetitive behaviors, such as insistence on sameness and routine, repetitive movement like rocking or hand flapping, intense interests, and sensory processing difficulty. These can also vary in severity. 25 to 30 percent of people diagnosed with ASD cannot meet their communication needs through speech alone. There are several proposed reasons for why this could be. Some people with autism also have apraxia of speech, a motor planning disorder that makes it difficult to willingly coordinate the muscles responsible for producing speech. The other two reasons someone with ASD has difficulty speaking is because of sensory processing disorder and difficulty segmenting speech. As hearing is the most disabling aspect of my autism, there is no doubt it affects my ability to speak. I will try to give you a feel for what it is like. When I was at the Closing the Gap conference, we were going to go out to eat with some folks from PRC Saltillo. I stepped inside the restaurant. Immediately, I was met with a dozen televisions, all playing the same sound, but just so slightly not at the same time. My brain took note of the difference and tried to quantify it. The pictures on the screens were not exactly lined up either. The air inside, filling my lungs, was hot and thick, a sharp contrast to the cold, stinging air outside. I could see a shine on all the tables, a plasticky coating painted over the swirling wood grain. I heard dozens of people having dozens of conversations. I heard them all separately, but could not pick out any individual words, a meaningless jumble of data forcing its way into my head. I felt like I was short-circuiting. A laugh rang out from the jumble of noise. I put on my headphones. The sound blurred, and the sound of my own breath was amplified and echoing. I held my device and pressed my fingers into the plastic. I could not feel my own skin, my own feet on the ground. I twisted my hands together hard. My brain felt like a mass of black static. I could hear my mom talking to me, but I could not process the meaning of her words. I could not rip my eyes away from the TV screens hanging above the table, though I barely wanted to. As you can imagine, it is difficult to communicate when your brain cannot make heads or tails of the sensory information it receives. I mentioned earlier that another reason autistic people may have trouble speaking is because of difficulty segmenting speech or understanding speech word by word instead of in chunks. When I was around three or four, I processed the speech I heard in this way. For instance, when I would watch Dora the Explorer, Dora and Boots would shout at Swiper, Swiper, no swiping. I would only process this entire message, not the separate words. Dora and Boots were communicating that they wanted him to stop. I understood that. I did not process the separate words, Swiper, which was addressing the Fox character. No, a word meaning in that situation to stop and swiping, taking our stuff. Eventually, I did learn how to take part sentences to understand individual words. My sister and I were homeschooled during early childhood, and my mom made a point to drown us in books. I realized, from being read to constantly and learning to read myself, that individual words had meaning and could be put together in novel ways to communicate basically anything. But even when I had a better grasp on the building blocks of language, 
speaking remain difficult for me, people will communicate in whatever way is easiest for them. For some, that is speaking, and for others, that is using a device or other method of AAC. But for a child like me, who had complex things to say and no way to say them, extreme behavior was sometimes the only outlet. I would get so frustrated with communication that I would hurt myself, something that around 50% of people with ASD experience at some point in their lives. Despite all the signs of ASD I showed as a child, I was not diagnosed until much later. There are many reasons for why this happened in my case. For one, it was the 1990s. Public awareness about autism was not as common as it is today. I was homeschooled during the time I would have been screened for autism in school. I do not have an intellectual disability, so when I joined public school, I did well academically. My differences were shrugged off as quirks, and of course I did not talk much. I had a speech disability. Many people on the autism spectrum learn how to mask or camouflage their autistic traits to blend in. They might not speak unless spoken to or memorize scripts for social interactions. They may learn to hide their repetitive behavior or change it into more socially acceptable or less visible behavior. Many people with ASD will tell you that the reason that they mask is to avoid victimization at home or school. This is an indescribably stressful way to live. I spent 15 years of my life learning how to mask. It came to a point where I could no longer hide and the stress became too much. My entire living situation was changed from that point and I finally got the help I needed. At 15 years old, I was diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder, level 2. There is much discussion today about how we talk about disability. For example, when describing someone with ASD, some prefer to say something like, Jack is a person with autism. They argue that the disability must be mentioned as separate from the person. Others argue that developmental disabilities are pervasive. It is not so easy to draw the line where the autism stops and Jack begins. I have had experiences that typical children have, but I also have some experiences that I would not have if I was not disabled. Disability is complicated. It is at the same time incredibly significant and unimportant. I am glad I was diagnosed with autism. After getting diagnosed, I did not feel like I had to hide so much anymore. Shortly after I was diagnosed with ASD, the caseworker at my high school suggested I take a look at AAC. So, I dove head first into learning all about AAC. Now we are on to part two, AAC operation and features. I mentioned before that one aspect of my autism is obsession with order and organization. As a kid, I organized my toys, but as a young adult, I found that I could take something inherently foreign to me, language, and observe how it could be organized, and I was good at understanding organization. I could make language make sense to me in my own way. Over the next few years of my life, I explored a host of different AAC iPad applications. In this part of the presentation, I will share with you what I have learned about AAC devices and how they operate. There are two main ways one can use high-tech AAC. One is by using letters to type out what you want to say, like using a keyboard. This is called text-based AAC. The other main way is to assign entire words to buttons on the grid, usually with a picture on the button that symbolizes the word. This is called symbol-based AAC. I do not hear this talk about a lot, but one misconception I have encountered is that symbol-based AAC is only for children or people who cannot read. This is untrue. Many cognitively able adults choose symbol-based AAC. Whole words are often faster to communicate with, especially for people with fine motor deficits or physical disabilities. The amount of vocabulary contained in a symbol-based system can range from a single word to thousands of words. When typing is included as an option, the amount of words one can communicate is unlimited. Robust vocabularies, those that contain hundreds or thousands of words, need to be organized. You cannot fit 1,000 words on a single screen. How vocabulary is organized is important when it comes to AAC. There needs to be a method behind the madness, so a wide range of users can understand the logic of how it is organized 
and not have to search for every single word they want to say. Organization of words and symbol-based AAC can happen in a couple of different ways, by part of speech, alphabetically, or by semantic category. A system organized by part of speech could look a little like this. If I wanted to say the word fight, I would have to press a folder labeled verbs or actions. Next, I would have to press an additional folder that contained all the verbs that start with the letter B. Then I could get the word I wanted. Many people prefer these types of programs because the way they are organized seems intuitive, but I do not use this type of system. Words for Life appeal to me most as a user because of how fast it is to use. This type of program is organized by semantic combinations. To say a word in Words for Life or Mincepeak, which is the philosophy Words for Life is built on, you combine two to three symbols, kind of like a recipe or math problem. To say, eat, you add together the apple symbol and the verb symbol. To say, hungry, you add together the apple symbol and the adjective symbol. To say other words associated with eating, you always press the apple symbol first, then use the other ideas contained in a symbol to get the word you want. For example, if I wanted to say bite, I would press the apple symbol, then the dog symbol, then the verb symbol. Biting is related to eating. Dogs bite, and bite is a verb. This sounds complicated, but it is really easy to use once you get the hang of it, because every word in this program is only two to three button presses away. No page goes deeper than three layers. Through a lot of practice and time, I was able to not only communicate exactly what I wanted to say, but communicate quickly as well. Part of becoming a proficient AAC user is learning from others. There was so much to learn from the AAC community online. Here, I will tell you three of the most important things I have learned from others. Number one, SNUG is important. SNUG stands for Spontaneous Novel Utterance Generation. Someone's communication should happen whenever they want and they should be able to communicate whatever they like versus only having access to whole phrases someone else has already programmed. Practically, this means that the user builds their messages word by word, instead of relying primarily on pre-stored phrases. Today, the most common AAC systems are all word-based, not solely phrase-based. When you are locked into only using phrases, it severely limits the flexibility of communication. Sure, I can say the phrase, I like that, but can I tell you that I found a new song I like and tell you the name of the song? Say we are on a walk and I have a phrase saying, can you help me? Do I need help crossing the street? Can you help me? Does not communicate anything specific. Of course, you could try to program everything you think someone might say into a device, but this would result in either a limited program or one so complex that it would be impossible to navigate. Language is just too complicated to be constrained into a finite number of complete sentences. The second thing I have learned is to keep the speech output on the device turned on. This makes it so every time I press a message button, the device will speak the word out loud. I prefer the device to speak each word as I type, as opposed to silently composing an entire message, then speaking the whole sentence, because it keeps the listening more engaged in the conversation. The third setting I always have on is the button beep feedback sound. My device makes that beeping noise whenever I touch it. You might think that is super annoying, but I find it really helpful. Because I struggle with sensory processing, hearing a beep every time I touch the screen is an alternative way my brain can understand that I have pressed something. All three of those settings I have changed because of what I have learned from other people in the AAC world. But who would I be if I did not have something to offer? I have sensory processing issues. So when I first saw a screen with the large grid of mostly white buttons over a light gray background, it was a little too much to take in visually. I knew that I had to modify some settings to be more sensory friendly. The first thing I did was make the page background a very dark gray blue. I also increased the space between the keys, which helped keep them more separated from me. Using a key guard also gives my brain additional sensory input so I can more accurately select the buttons I want. I personally spray painted my key guard black, 
which further separated the space between the buttons. I also changed some of the color coding to be less saturated. Everyone has different sensory needs. I think it can be beneficial to alter some simple things like that on the device to make it more sensory friendly to the individual user. I want to talk about one last thing in this section. One component of LAMP is especially helpful to me. Having a unique and consistent motor plan makes my device feel automatic and communication should feel automatic. Consistency with motor planning is key to automaticity with AAC. This consistency can be accomplished by each word having its own location on the device that never changes. To say the word, read, I always press the button in the 9-4 location, then the 3-3 location. No other combination of buttons will produce the word read for me. Just like you always say the word read with your mouth in the same way without thinking, I can do the same thing with my hands. If I had to pick at one feature as the most important, it would be having a unique and consistent motor plan. Using any AAC program without this consideration is immensely frustrating. I do not want to have to look for the word I want. I just want to say it. So far, we have talked about my story with autism and obtaining AAC. We have talked about some basics about the organization and features of AAC programs, but the most important part of AAC is actually using it socially. This brings us to part three, living life as a proficient AAC user. There are some things AAC users can do to be better understood and communicate more effectively. And there are things that a speaking person can do to be a good communication partner. I will talk about some tips for AAC users first. Knowing how to control volume to suit a situation is one such AAC skill. It seems like an obvious thing, but it is actually really important. There are times when the volume needs to be turned up all the way and times where the volume should be turned down. Sometimes it is even appropriate to turn off the volume or speech output and show the message to someone instead. I could switch my volume level several times in the span of an hour to fit the social situation. Another skill is programming. I think it is good for users to at least understand how their device operates and how they themselves can add words. Say someone asks what my favorite TV show is. My favorite show is Criminal Minds. I do not have the word criminal on my device, so I would have to spell that. That is 11 button presses, including the space bar and page navigation. To say, Minds, I go to my Think page, press, Mind, then choose my word, Minds, on the third page. Because I love Criminal Minds so much, I have programmed it into my device. I changed a message that took 14 hits to say into one that takes only three. I have one last tip for AAC users. Many people in public have never seen a device before. In my experience, most people in the community are pretty cool, even if they do not know what an AAC device is. But sometimes you come across someone that does not respect your communication boundaries. For those situations, I have some programmed phrases for self-advocacy. Having phrases like, please do not touch my device or please be patient while I type, allows you to communicate your social needs and preferences quickly. Now, here are some tips for communication partners. If you are afraid of interacting with an AAC user, do not worry. We are people, not werewolves. However, I think I might ease some anxieties if I give you some practical tips for interacting with an AAC user. Also, Please keep in mind that AAC users are not a homogeneous group. We all have different preferences. It is always a good idea to ask about someone's individual communication preferences if you are unsure about something. The first tip I have is to be patient. Most people speak at around 150 words per minute, but users generally communicate at a much slower rate. Some users may also struggle with auditory processing so they may need some extra time to respond. When people are patient with me, I feel way less rushed or like I have to give quick responses. Another tip is to not be afraid to ask for clarification if needed. Sometimes text to speech voices are a little hard to understand, so it is perfectly reasonable to ask someone for clarification or to repeat themselves. Here is my third tip. A little sensitivity can help the user feel included. 
There are times when it can be appropriate to talk about someone's disability or AAC, but making every chat about that is boring. Keeping the focus on the conversation itself is the way to go. Fourth, avoid touching an adult user's device without their permission. A device is really personal to whoever is using it. I think of my device as my voice. So just like you would not push someone's wheelchair without asking, please do not touch, handle, or take away someone's device. For the fifth and final tip, I have one more centered around beginner communicators. People will communicate in whatever way is easiest for them, and many users use several methods to communicate. If my sister asked me if I wanted to play a game, and I said, yeah, verbally, and she responded by saying, tell me on your device, that would drive me crazy. As long as the mode of communication is understood, please do not insist someone use one way or another to say something they have already told you with clarity. Today, you have heard my story about growing up with autism. We have talked about how AAC operates, and I have covered why and how I use some features on my device to be a better communicator. Finally, I explained some of the soft skills needed for social interaction with the device and some tips to help you communicate with an AAC user. I want to end by talking about why this all matters. Sometimes, parents ask why their nonverbal child needs AAC. They believe, to put this bluntly, that their child's thoughts are simple and that their every need can be anticipated. But a child with disabilities will grow into an adult with disabilities. Will their public school teacher understand them? Will their classmates understand them? Or the local librarian? Or the police? Or support workers at a group home? What kind of control will this person have over their life with their current mode of communication, not just with their parents, but with other people in the community? What kind of relationships will this person be able to cultivate? Will people get the opportunity to get to know them as they know themselves, or will their innermost thoughts never be understood by another? I think some people see a device that looks and sounds like a robot and has dozens of buttons. But when I think about AAC and the autonomy it gives me, I do not see plastic and metal and a glass screen. I do not hear text-to-speech voice. I do not see picture cards or communication binders made of laminated paper and Velcro. I see freedom. I see newfound agency. I see a catalyst for human connection. When I was a little kid, I had so many things I needed and wanted to communicate. I wanted to say that loud noises hurt my ears and looking at people's eyes felt like looking into the sun. I wanted to say that there was no greater joy for me than spinning in circles or playing the same eight notes on the piano again and again. I was not simple. I was a full human being with thoughts and feelings and a unique way of experiencing the world. It is my greatest hope that all people with complex communication needs will someday be able to communicate without limitation. Every nod, smile, frown, every word that is spoken or typed or pointed to brings us to a better understanding of each other and the diversity of the human experience. Thank you. Yeah, you know, that was my first time hearing it, and I am so honored. You you are so gifted, and you shared right from your heart. I remember the first time you told me that when you were a child, sometimes you you you, would, you got so frustrated that you hurt yourself. And you, you told me you wanted me to share that with people so that, that they would know that if they're going through that, and 50% of children or people with autism at some point, 50% of them will hurt themselves. So I, it was, how did it? How does it feel to get that all out of your chest at the end? Are you excited that it's over or how to? I think it makes it better that I experienced that because it might help other people who are in the same situation. Yes, and how long did it take you to write that speech? I mean, how many days did you work on it? I think it took me about a week 
Well, it was beautiful. There's a part in there. I'll, I'm going to go back and play it again. I'm going to quote you or play that part. There was a part in there that really touched me when you got that last part when you were going through what a device means to you. With that, that was I've never heard that delivered with that with that power. So um, anyway, uh, how about you take some questions from the pan the people because I think your your insights just need to they, they need to hear from you more than they need to hear hear me talk. So let's just. Uh, Stephanie, will you help get some questions from the crowd? Yes, absolutely. I've been reading them. Um, where to start? I, I'm going to start with um, a couple of questions that go together. Uh, do you ever change the location of an icon for any reason? And um, when you first started using high tech AAC, did you have access to full vocabulary or were some icons masked? They kind of go together. Um. So, for the first question, I have moved basically all the word words, but do not do this unless you are crazy. I just happen to be pretty particular and for the other question I did not start with words for life I used a different program but when I started using word-based vocabulary. I did not mask anything. Yeah, you would, it would, you started when you were older and you saw a touch, you saw a Delta talker. Tell that story about how you, how you got your first device. It was at a day program, I was going to, and I <laughs> saw it and loved how it looked. I asked if I could take it home with me and they Dad. Yes. Yeah. So you're self-taught. So, and uh, I want people to know that after I met Catalina, just shortly after I met her, she uh, wrote me a paper. Uh, it should have been a dissertation. I've never shared it with anyone. It's between her and I because I don't. Want, I don't want the backflack she would get from it. But she, she wrote me a paper on all the different programs and what was good and bad about them. And uh, it's quite a paper. Uh, uh, so. Uh, uh, so what what did you say when you sent it to me? What was your how did you say you'd been there was some reason you said you were go ahead, yeah. I had so much coffee. She had too much coffee. So you were caffeinated, too caffeinated, you got work, and it was just an amazing piece of work though. So um any other any other questions, uh, Stephanie? That's... Yes. So, you know, we we titled this using the word gestalt, just and um Katlena and I have talked about this and John, we've all talked with Katlena about this and, and, you know, Katlena, if you were a little one now and working with a speech therapist, there would, you would probably have been identified as, as a gestalt language processor because of your use of echolalia and phrases as a little one. Um, so some of the questions coming in are, going to ask you to kind of reflect back to what you would have been, you know, what you can remember from that time. And, um, and so some just, I, I guess, thinking about your perspective about if you could go back in time and have access to the AAC that you do now and kind of reflecting on how you were as a little one, um, can you imagine how it would have been helpful for you uh, 
you know, phrases, words, all the words, some of the words. I think being able to hear separate word words in a device like this would have been super beneficial for me in my understanding of other others and my own communication. And um, I know many folks here probably read um, the blog posts that you've written. Can you talk about your concept of word development with regards to literacy? Now, when I say concept of word, for those that don't know what that means, it, you know, it can apply to concept of word for literacy as well as for receptive language skills. Can you share your journey with that with your literacy skills? For me, being able to see the word words on paper really helped me have a more concrete understanding of word words it made it more easy to understand because they did not just fade away like word words I was hearing. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know how much time you spent around little ones, little children, maybe who are not speaking and might who might have some extreme sensory processing and regulation and, you know, attention and, and control of body issues happening. Um, now, I know you're not a speech pathologist, and even though I think you should go to school to be one, I think you'd be a fantastic AAC speech. I, I'm all for that. Um, yeah. Um, can you think of, and we've talked about some of the ways that you might have used AAC or someone might have used the AAC device to get your attention or to, you know, like the swipe or no swiping example. We talked about that once before. Um, do you have any creative ideas that if you were sitting with a little one, like the little one you were, that you might try if they weren't initially interested in the device or making sense of it? It is so hard to know if somebody actually processes language in that way, especially if they are not speaking. But for me, I think it would have been helpful to use my interests to open up the conversation. For example, I really liked Joseph and the amazing Technicolor dream coat talking about colors would have been a good way to get me interested. And so, can, oh, go ahead. Oh, no, no, sorry, I'm sorry, Stephanie, keep going. Well, this ties into what she just said. Um, so Kathleen wrote, and this ties into that. So do you think your phrases like swipe or no swiping or segments from um, Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Code, do you think those chunks being programmed as one button would have been helpful in the beginning stages for you? I don't know. 
maybe as a way to get me interested initially, but I do not think it would be a good idea long term because the phrase phrases I used to communicate with that would not make any sense to most people. It's 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 not really one or the other, is it? You, there's nothing wrong with having. A, we have thousands of empty locations. You you hit the yes button, and the only the entire screen's empty for people to customize kids' favorite things in there or passions in there. And going to your passions, you already said it would have been important. But what's but I think what I really want to see the field, and I don't. I, I need a three hour four hour presentation. I'm not going to steal yours. But we've been talking about what to do to make segmentation happen uh, uh, in how you set up a device is critical. When people don't understand that motor plans, that the motor cortex is involved in, in how sensory integration is involved, uh, motor, auditory, and visual together. And when, when they don't understand that gestures and speech share a common neural structure, and that you, you if you, you have to give people a path to spontaneous novel generate utterances is what you're saying and what bothers me most when people don't don't give kids systems that allow them to produce word order in their choice the the human being has to be able to put words in their own order not not have a device that does it for them and so if i want to say my dad go to work i should be able to say a sentence in, in the order i choose to say words and what people do is they put kids on devices that predict the next word. So it says, let's go, and up comes outside. And sure, in the initial stage, that might look like a great way to give a kid a, a, a quicker way to say, let's go outside. But what you've really done is not give them the ability to say outside in isolation so they can say no outside, my outside, daddy outside. And so it looks easier, but in the end, it's actually harder. And so nothing wrong with all new interventions overshoot. And so I'm catching some overshooting going on in our field. And, and uh, uh, someone at a recent training told me that uh, they've been taught from no programming words in any kid's device because words become gestalts. I, 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 I didn't know how to, don't even know how to comprehend questions, comments like that. But, um, but anyway, the truth is, is that if, it, if a kid has something that, that gives them pleasure and joy in communication, then we should be adding those to those, but they have to have a word-based system, a, a robust word-based system at the same time like you have. I haven't seen you spell a word yet since you started this presentation. Have you spelled any words? I have done a few. I am just fast. Yeah, I didn't see you. you. You tricked me. Can I tell them, can you demonstrate what happens when your voice doesn't match? People will, <laughs> this, is, this is a great example. Of, let me explain it for you to show it. But what happens is people check, pick voices for kids to, on their devices. And the voice needs to come out as the individual talks. So when you hit the two buttons to say eat, the, the, the sound has to come out immediately. Otherwise, what happens is you get a delay between the touch and the auditory output, which was, becomes a sensory integration nightmare. So, Catalina, demonstrate what happens when you pick the wrong voice for your device. I like to go with my friends. Friends. <laughs> see, see. And when your device talks faster than you can keep up with it, how does it make you feel? Confused. Yes. You're not the only one. The other device users tell me the same thing. When it when the voice doesn't come out when they touch, some of them get a headache. Some of them say it hurts. Everything else, they can't. They, it's like watching a movie where the lips don't match. I had this. Uh, so Steph, how are we doing? I guess we have ten minutes. So, John, there are twenty two more questions to get. All right, keep keep going. <laughs> um, I'll answer part of this. The percentage of individuals with ASD who also have apraxia 
that percentage ranges from a third to I've seen 64% of, of co um, diagnoses. It was two to seven years was 41%. And I think by the time they got above seven, I think it went down to 27% study I usually quote. And um, the question is, were you diagnosed with apraxia? And um, how many years did it take you to become proficient using high tech AAC? It took me a couple of year years to get fast with it, but I am always learning. Right. And you know, you were already literate when you got your AAC device, correct? Um, do you notice, are you reading the words or looking at the pictures or either when you're using it? It is mostly memory, but I do, I only tend to look at word words I do not say a lot so what you're saying is but what, what uh, you're basically when you're talking you don't you're not putting cognitive effort into where that word is or what part of speech it is uh I, I would love people to google this so google these words to do some re research on this area so we are what i've been reading a lot about or i can share you what i've been reading that gestures and speech share a common neural structure and that gestures so the, basically they're one so when i say the word sleep catalina that not only does she hear the word sleep, but she practices that word because it's automatic. But once, you, so that that's the benefit of multisensory convergence or mirror neurons. But so when, when you're talking on the device, you don't have to think about your hand movement no more than I have to think about my mouth moving. And that automaticity is what allows you to, to be spontaneous and novel and not have to think to talk. So you can pay attention to the, to the room and the environment. Why do you think so many people think that so why didn't spelling work for you? Because it isn't, it is a, 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 it's 26 letters. They don't move. You got a motor plan for every word. So why doesn't spelling work for the, most of the devices we talk to? For me, I have to think using symbol symbols is faster. I am also not a great Speller. Well, see, I've been talking to you and Lance and all the device users for 30 years, and I think having the both is the optimal situation. But for, for I think the statistic is somewhere around 90 to 80 percent of complex communicate people have complex communications cannot use spelling as an encoding method. But then what I find ironic is the 20 percent of you that can use that encoding method, a lot of you have access issues that you don't have, but some of them do. And then it's so slow that, it, and then I think there's something cognitive about going J-O-H-N. It's not just that it's more keystrokes. There's something about kicking into that spell mode that's different than having it just be a gesture that this is John and this is Sally. And uh, so anyway, I think there's, uh, there, I think that's true. I think spelling is an open cognitive task while using your device as a closed task. You're not having to think about it. I think you demonstrate that closed task communication really well. All right, are you ready for another question? I'm gonna to try to bundle several of these together. Um, the question, the first part is um, your use of AAC versus verbal speech. And does that amount change with who you're speaking to? And then also this question, which maybe John might have an opinion about as well. Um, when you said, don't ask the client to tell me, quote unquote, tell me on the device, what do you recommend for clients and families who interpret and use all nonverbal communication. It's so great they are communicating, but others don't understand. So I find myself saying, tell me on the device, or let's find it on your talker so they can learn. What other suggestions do you have for situations like this? So as for speech, I do have some speech ability, I find it a bit easier to talk to my cat, cats, 
than to people. And John might have something to say for the next one, but for people saying to use the device, I think that is okay if the communication is not understood by other others yeah, I think I think if the, if if it's a natural sabotage that someone doesn't understand, and you have to say, "I'm I apologize, but I'm not getting it." Can you help? Can you give me a word or two on the talker that gets me on topic? But I think when it's not natural, I think when you already understood the person, I think to say "say it again" is what we're talking about. I, I think if when your sister asked you, "Do you want to play a game?" and you say yes, like you use your sign yes to me really quick when we're and and there's no there's no reason why I would ever say say it on your talker, but I, I don't feel bad if you've ever done that because. We all want children to be able to use their devices, so we push sometimes too hard. But what you can do instead is when you see the child say uh, cookie, and he says coo, and you say, were you saying cookie? And he says, yes. You say, I didn't understand you. When you can, go over to the device and show them where it is and just say, oh, can I, if you don't mind me touching, if you have a second device, it's better. But can I see if I know where it is on your device? And look, let's see where it is for next time you're around somebody who's not as talented as knowing your sounds and understanding your signs because let's face it if you go to a stranger tonight and you do this to them they may not they might figure it out it means yes but they may not and the, and and then i think like you said you don't want people touching your talker but i think the right person could say with the with respect can i show you where it is on your talker for next time uh when someone doesn't needs to say it but make sure you know the child's there's one feature that I push all the time, and that's that word finder, where you go to word finder, spell a word, and it shows you where the word is. Make sure you learn that feature and show the individual that feature so they can learn to find their own words when maybe they don't know where the word is, so they keep vocalizing it or trying to say it with a gesture. Wonderful answers. I'm going to keep going. I'm trying to get to everybody. We're down to 18 now. I'm going to combine two of them. Um, the first question is... What do you recall what kind of activities you participated in to help you learn how to segment out the different words from swipe or no swiping into individual words? So do you remember specific activities or moments or learning how to read and write helped a lot? Back to that make... concept of word. And one thing you may there's a lot I, uh, it, uh, believe it or not, the entire five-hour LAMP training is on segmentation of speech and how the method was designed to make segmentation happen. And so an example of that for a child is that the font is at its largest setting, so that when the child says the word eat, the font has to be large, the voice has to be loud, there has to be no delay in the speech coming out. The beep is also helpful, like you said, the key guard's critical. Uh, all those things can help make um, uh that segmentation of speech more likely to happen. Uh, and one consistent unique motor movement that's short, um, that's really is important. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people don't understand why we're so pure about that. Uh, I, I sort of get these negative sort of vibes sometimes people saying that it's got a cult following or something about it. But the reason is because, because if there's more than one way to say something, um, imagine there was, this is a sign for more, but imagine if someone said, yeah, but you can do it this way too. Well, then when I say the word more, I can't, my, my, my mirror neuron activity can't practice it because remember, this becomes the word more and more becomes this, but I can't do that if I have two or three ways to do the same sound. So there, you really have to dig deep into understanding the reasons why we're pure about having one consistent, one unique motor plan for each word and how that relates to segmentation of speech. Okay, so I'm just going to pause for a moment and acknowledge that it's six o'clock. And I know many of you have a strict schedule, you have things to do. I want you to know that the recording and the link to your certificate of um, attendance for tonight, you will receive that 24 hours from now. It's an automated email that goes out from Zoom. And Kathleen and John, if, if you have a few moments, we could go ahead and continue to go through a few more questions. I have to pay. I have to. I have to pay Catalina by the word. So I know, John. <laughs> Better go donate some blood. 
So yeah. those of you that I know you need to go, don't fear the FOMO. It'll be recorded and you'll get the link tomorrow. But for those of you that can hang on a few more minutes, I think we can wrap this up in five or so minutes, five or 10 minutes. Right. I don't think we um, want to sh shut Catalina down yet. No. Um, okay. So I want to go back to the whole segmentation of speech and programming and phrases and all that stuff. Um, what are your, th so the question is, I guess what I wonder about programming gestalts into the device is if a person can produce those phrases verbally, how would it be helpful for gestalts to be in the device? Can you imagine a scenario where that would be helpful for you? If you're able to verbalize to also have it in. Personally, I do not program in any Just talk because I am able to say them. Yeah, I, I, in my own self, I, I can actually see a purpose in doing it if you were then working on mitigating it where you had the word-based system that would allow, allow you to break that apart so they could see it. I'm, I'm, I just don't think you have to be, I don't think you have to be in one camp or the other. I think there's room to... To, to be open-minded enough to say there are some children that are, it's going to help, but they're going to, but you have to promise me you'll uh, have a plan for how you're going to get them to a word-based system. And, and you, you can't start with phrases. You have to, you can start with both, but you can't not have a robust word-based system with a motor plan attached to a sound with the word and then start with phrases and think that somehow we're going to go through those phrases and then mitigate them. Uh, if a child's nonverbal, then we don't know. We can guess on some of those gestalts, and we can see their nonverbal forms of communication and program some of those things in there. But it's it's going down a real dangerous path when we start putting words in people's heads what goes on a device, right. and not giving them a, not giving them a way to encode spontaneously in the future. I do want to acknowledge a comment that just came through from Alex Wolgma. Probably totally mispronounced your name, Alex. I apologize. He said that I program them them into my own AAC because sometimes I can't say them. Mm -hmm. And that was a point that I, I wanted to ask you about, Catalina, when you spoke about your time at Closing the Gap and you went into that noisy restaurant and how overwhelmed you felt. Uh, but I think it's important for people to recognize, and I've seen this with my friend Lance um, and others who have an element of apraxia you know, diagnosis of apraxia and sensory processing differences, when those two things get locked in and sent over the edge, everything kind of shuts down. And it, it's really difficult to even communicate on your device when you're 100%. Is that how it is for you? Yes. In that situation, I actually signed to my mom that I wanted to leave because in the, the, that moment, I could not use my device. Right. And I think that's a really valid point to make for AAC users for as in terms of self-advocacy and knowing their self themselves and um, having that backup, but even then, if you have backup, it, it might not even be accessible to you without a lot of effort. Um, this is an interesting question. Is use, Have you ever explored Unity 144, Catalina? Yes. What, um, so is that something you ever considered? I actually used a program before that had a lot of buttons like that, but I found that having the buttons a little bigger helped me be faster. Yeah, you know, we have quite a few 144 users switching over, like Anthony Arnold and stuff. And uh, uh, there's a lot of components to LAMP that get over. I mean, so I think 29 buttons weren't used in 144. They were they were keys. They were story race. So, so you didn't really. It was it wasn't 140, 144 buttons or 128 buttons versus 
84 buttons it was like 10 extra buttons for programming and the way we space buttons farther apart do you find that beneficial by having icons yes I, i've never met a device user who didn't tell me that when we checkerboarded space and made words that are likely to be cut together farther apart that was actually the most unique part of lamp words for life and the most beneficial part and the one place that has some research on was when we made motor plans less less more unique not uh, we made it made motor plans dissimilar by putting things farther apart, like good good and bad don't sit next to each other and eat and drink and lie and turn. That actually made it easier for device users, but not just the beginning users, but even individuals like yourself. So, um, two combo questions: uh, Where did you place the self advocacy statements in your lamp program, and do you have specific pages dedicated or created for special interest? So some this some of the customized vocabulary. Can you talk about that? I put my phrase phrases under the word okay, <laughs> which is most like the word please on the normal words for life and for personal vocabulary, I just put it in the most similar category, categories like my favorite movie is under watch yeah you so you you took the architecture that was there and expanded when you could now they don't know that you did another thousand words for us recently and i'm still working on getting the and uh but you followed the architecture that was originally there pretty well an example of what you did for us is when you go to body parts you added a button that would take you to more age appropriate uh more more developmental stuff in there that people might need but some people should have the option of putting those in from the very beginning, but not every kid wants those words, all those words in there from the beginning. So, but you, you, your, your ability to follow the architecture that was there is pretty gifted. You, you follow the men speak architecture really well. So. Mm -hmm. And I want to clarify, Brianna was asking, can we make lamp have more space between buttons? Um, do you mind showing like maybe you're a fruit page or something? I think, on do you have like fruits on your yeah. i just want i think that that's what confused her um mine how, are put together yeah but they are not in the program usually got it okay well brianna what we're talking about putting more space between buttons that was really just the the on the second and third level hit pages buttons were not all squinched together they were checkerboarded out um, well and e even on the core board they were spe separated on purpose so if we were in prepositions we if there was many of them together we spaced them apart by by change the metaphor the analogy on purpose to make the visual perceptual load less so um catlina and john um both think about this one for someone who's learning language and using gestalt uh, guessing phrases verbally do you think that a communication partner modeling each word of us spoken gestalt i'm guessing each word of the phrase that the child is speaking on advice might be helpful with segmentation doesn't seem very natural to me maybe yeah. i did yeah I did hear another AAC user share that um, hearing the communication partner's voice while they modeled words on the device was challenging for them to process both voices at the same time. If if someone, I know that I hear that if I hear two people talking at the same time, my brain stops working completely. Can you imagine if someone was communicating with you, talking on the device and with their mouth at the same time, would that present a problem for you processing their languages, both streams of language? For me, it would be, no. but I do not know if that is 
universal. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, just a couple of more questions. Um, do you have feelings about the terms nonverbal or non-speaking? And are there alternatives I you would suggest? Prefer nonverbal over non-speaking. Mm -hmm. And just this is a preference, I think. Um, someone has noticed that you don't use your speech display bar after you no. compose your message. Can you explain why that is? Most of the time, I just do not think it is necessary, but it is a personal preference mm -hmm. yeah because you speak at a rate that's fast enough you haven't lost the listener it wouldn't probably make to me it wouldn't make sense that you would say this twice at the end but for a person who has a little slower access skill or access method might possibly get the listener but might be a good thing for the listener to have have a kickback again all right well um there's still so many questions well um, I know, I think we could need to wrap it up. Um, I will just ask this last question because it sounds like it's from a mom and it might be helpful um, and get some feedback from both of you. Uh, Sasha said, I have two children with ASD and apraxia. My third grader gets upset when my first grader is able to sometimes speak. How would you suggest I work with him or her separately so they both get something out of learning? I am not sure. John, do you have a idea? You know, I found that uh, you're going to hate this answer, but I, I found that the uh, people giving clinical advice on kids they don't know to be, uh, it's almost unethical. That's a tough one without knowing the, your children and meeting them and actually putting my hands on them, watching a video of them and talking to your whole team. I do know that if I try to understand what you said again, though, because uh, uh, she has two children, and when you're working with one, the other one gets upset. Is that correct? Is that it sounds like the younger one is able to verbally speak sometimes, and that makes the older one frustrated and upset. Yeah. Sometimes there was a study once. I don't know if I could find it, so I'll just forgive me for the, bringing it up, but there was a study. I don't know if anybody in this room has misophonia where you, uh, someone's slurping sound bothers you, but yeah, I have it too. And I've ruined a lot of Thanksgiving dinners. You usually have it for the person you love, you love most. Anyway, they took this medicine and it goes away. You can actually not ruin Thanksgiving dinner. But anyway, there was a study once I read about kids with autism who had that same part of the brain would react when they heard someone talking. So you know, let's say the, let's say it's a sensory issue for the brother to hear the other brother talking and it actually hurts or but then if there's some way to, to work with your OT to work on some desensitization to the voice or to voices or because he loves the brother, his voice bothers him more or work with your team to uh, try to address that. Um, uh, but do, do, do know all those kids, all kids need some time alone with their parents where they're not competing for your attention too. But I'm positive. I don't have a good answer for that without knowing you more. And then I would just be guessing but i do empathize empathize emphasize empathize, i can't get the word out have empathy for what you're going through there well i think it's a good time to wrap it up what do you think Are you guys ready to be done yes thank you catalina stephanie thank you for the last three nights and catalina you did your speech was wonderful but your interaction with the people is always inspiring we're very grateful to have you on our team so thank you catalina thank you there were some questions about inviting Catlina to do other speaking engagements. And I have put in the chat window uh, a link to Catlina's ambassador page, which has a, an automated email system that can send to her. And um, Catlina is a, is, has a valuable and important voice. So feel free to reach out to her. Um, Catlina, the excitement right? is, uh, you always have that excitement on your face, but I want people to always know that you do this with a love of the job, don't you? I don't want everybody to think wherever it's not about money for you. I know that, but you're worth every penny. And I love that we get to learn from you and with you. So, yeah. so thank you. Good night, everybody. Thanks for coming. Thank you.
Good night. Bye. Bye. Goodbye.